Hello, welcome back to the channel. Today we are going to be going over the declaration and assignments of variables, as well as some of our basic data types here in C++. If you haven't checked out the other two videos I've done so far, feel free to go check those out and then come back to this one after that. But yeah, without further ado, let's just jump right into the tutorial. Okay, so as I showed you guys last time, I like to have a bit of a header at the start of all of my coding files, just so I know what's going on there. If I look at this code like six months, 10 years, whatever, down the line, and I just don't remember what this was for, especially because I'm just labeling this as a project for my YouTube tutorials, and I'm just labeling the actual files themselves by episode. So it's gonna be helpful in a few years or whenever I ever end up looking back at this with these descriptions to at least have an idea of what's going on in the actual project, in the actual files. So yeah, I would highly recommend that. I mean, if you're working on a coding project for school, if you're just doing a personal project, if you're answering coding problems, whatever you're doing when you're doing that, I would highly recommend adding these headers just so you have an idea of what's going on for the future. Also, it helps when other people want to look at your code as well, just so they know what's going on as well. Now, as always, we have the hashtag include IO stream and using namespace STD, just so we don't have to write those out in our main function later on. So what we're just doing here is we're going to start by just going over what each of these different comments mean and what they're saying and then giving an example of what they're talking about. So to begin with, let's talk about how to declare an integer variable. We've seen this already from the last video, but just so you guys are aware, um, for an integer, we have the keyword of int, which signifies an integer. And then we're just going to name this one int x. And then we're just going to have a semicolon there after that. Now, if we want to also assign it a value, what we can do from there is in this line where it says how to assign an integer. Well, what we're going to do here is take x and set it equal to 100. So essentially the difference between declaration and assignment, a declaration is when you're actually naming the variable and an assignment is when you're giving it a value of the given type that you said. So for example, since integer or since x is an integer, right? Whatever values that we're giving it have to be an integer as well. So since we're giving it the int value of 100, that's now the value of x. Now we can also do both things at once because you know sometimes we just want to give something an initial value. We already know what that value is going to be. And so let's give an example of that. So we'll say int y equals oh, int y equals 200. So what this does is just say, okay, we're creating an integer of y and we're setting it to 200. We're doing all of that at once. You don't have to do this all at once like we saw in the previous two lines, but you can. And also later on down the line, if you wanted, you can say y equals 10 or y equals x. All of that stuff is possible later on. It's just in this specific line, we are doing both the assignment and declaration. We can always continue to assign new values later on down the line in our code. Now let's try declaring and assigning multiple values at once. And the reason for this would be, say you're just clustering in your code different uh, declarations. Say you have um, a group of values. So you want to say like the function for, I don't know, a trapezoid, right? Or actually let's do triangle, right? You, you have uh, A, B, and C, and you want to do Pythagorean's theorem. Say that's just an example code that you're trying to do. And so maybe later on you have another mathematical entity or whatever that you're trying to calculate. So for this section, you just want to create A, B, and C. So let's say int A equals three, B equals four, and C equals five. So that's cool, you can do that. And then you can also do something where, let's say you have answer, right? And you're gonna store the answer there um, for Pythagorean's theorem. I guess Pythagorean's theorem doesn't really work here because 
A, B, or C is what you're solving for, but you get my point. You just got a function that uses A, B, and C somewhere in there, and now you can also just do answer equals A plus B plus C. We're just ignoring the Pythagorean theorem example now. Um, I just think this works fine. So you get my you get my drift, right? You understand what I'm trying to say here. Um, you can do both, right? You can just say, okay, I'm going to declare multiple values and then you just name another one over here. It's all good. You can mix and match in in order. You could say, okay, A has a value, B doesn't have a value, C has a value, answer has a value, whatever. Like it, it's whatever you want to do here. You can just declare multiple of the same type. So that, that is the one caveat here. They all have to be of type int in order for this to happen or whatever type you are specifying. We'll get into different types in a second, but before we move on to that, I have two other things to mention. So we have this big blurb here and I took this directly from W3 schools because I didn't feel like writing this out by myself. And well, they give all the rules that you need anyway. So these are rules for how to name your variables because there are specific things that you have to do in order to type out your variables. There are certain uh, values, there are certain characters that you can't use. So like special characters are not able to be used, things that are already being used as other keywords. So for example, like return, you can't use that as a variable because it already has an expressed purpose in the language. So let's just go down the list and see what's listed here. Names can contain letters, digits, and underscores, so that makes sense. Letters and digits, any alphanumeric stuff there, you can go for that. And, you know, you could just do like temp1, temp2, temp3, etc. All the way to infinity. Uh, you could do words that have underscores in between them instead of spaces. And the reason for that is because you cannot have any spaces, which is actually another one of these rules as well. The second one here is names must begin with a letter or an underscore, so you can't start with a number here. I think that might depend on the language, although I always start with letters to begin with. That's just kind of the method that I've gone with for as long as I can remember. I just think it makes more sense to have a clear description, and then usually I only mix in numbers if it has some significance. So for example, if I'm doing temp1, temp2, temp3, or something else like that, you know? It really just depends. Names are case sensitive, so this also depends on the language. Some languages will not be strongly, like they, they won't be case sensitive, right? Um, so it just depends. Um, in this language, in C++, that is the case. So in this example, as you can see, my var with a capital V is different from my var without a capital V. Names cannot contain white, space, white spaces or special characters like exclamation point, the number sign, percent, etc. So I kind of talked a bit about this. It's just numbers, letters, underscores. So that's really what you got to work with. And reserved words cannot be used as names. So yeah, that's all of the rules that you should keep in mind. And you know, if you just see a compiler error or if you need to refer back to this list, go back to W3Schools, but you'll just get an error if you um, do this incorrectly and you can fix it from there. The last thing to go over on this page is going to be the creation of constants. So I typically don't really use constants in a lot of the code that I've written, but it can be useful some, for something that you're doing. It really just depends. I mean, the expressed purpose of a constant is that it's not going to be changed later on. So, you know, if you have a case where you know you're always going to have a specified value and say you're just specifying it at the top of your code so that if you ever have to change it, you just change it in that one spot and you're good. Maybe a constant's better off for what you want to do. I typically just use an integer or a variable in general because it has a bit more flexibility for changes later on down the line. But regardless, it just depends on what type of work you're doing, what type of thing you're trying to build. So let's go over how this is made. So const int test equals 100. So in this example, we're creating a constant of a type of integer, and it's called test. So this value is always just going to hold the value of 100. And yeah, that's pretty much all there is to talk about here. I mean, you can mess around with all of these different values and all of these different elements that I discussed, but primarily we're talking about constants, some of the rules behind naming variables. Um, of course, we're also discussing the assignment and declaration of variables as well. So yeah, 
Hope that was helpful for you guys. The next thing we are going to be talking about are the different data types. I'm just going to throw it out there. I am curious if anyone actually uses doubles all that often. I just normally don't, but you know, I'll explain what that is in a second for those who don't know. I just thought I'd ask as well, but yeah, typically most of the things that I do use integers over floating points to begin with. So using double precision is kind of rare for me. Booleans. I use every now and again, and then similarly we got characters and strings. So those are the general groups that we're going to be going over right now, but typically I'm just using, you know, integers, strings, booleans. I think that really covers most of them. And then, you know, characters and doubles and floating points really just depends on the application, but I haven't had to use them too, too often. However, that being said, you know, I might end up doing a project very soon with you guys that would require that stuff depending on you know what I decide to do in the end regardless let's just jump directly into what we have here so the first type that we're going to be talking about is a decimal data type and just so you guys understand data types are essentially just a way of defining the type of data that we have I guess that's kind of a circular definition but for example we can call data as words, right? We can call something a character. We can call something a integer, a rational number, things like that. Those are the types of classifications that we can give to different types of text and numbers, etc. So that's essentially what we're doing here in code. It's just they're called slightly different things for some of them, and I'll explain them moving forward. So integers. Integers are values that do not have a decimal point in them. They hold value within two to four-ish bytes. I think this might also depend on the program that you're looking at, what exactly you're doing, stuff like that. But just so you guys understand a byte, it's not super important for this, but I will explain real quick. A byte is essentially eight bits. Eight bits are machine code a bit is either a one or a zero which means if you're looking at like a circuit board or something like that it's either a signal being on or off and that translates loosely to or directly to memory and when we're talking about memory we then have to think well what type of unit are we talking about here so 8 bits became 1 byte, and so that's what we're talking about right now. You don't really have to know that, it's just the idea is the amount of bytes is just how much memory something takes up. So four to, uh, 2 to 4 bytes is how much we're talking about when we're talking about a integer. And so let's look at what an integer actually looks like. So I have int integer equals 300. So we've already seen this, this isn't anything too crazy. Um, I'm just calling this integer here just so you guys understand what I'm talking about moving on I think that's pretty self-explanatory if you guys have questions just let me know in the comments for any of these Let's move on to high precision or floating point precision numbers. So these numbers have six to seven decimal points associated with them so if you're trying to do something with a decimal point and you don't want to I guess have to carry around an exponent of some kind along with it and you want to actually store what you're looking at as just a decimal value you don't have to deal with decimal points or anything like that externally or in some other manner that you got to think your logic in um, this is what you're going to use right so for example if you don't want to write like I, I don't know 0 0.003 as 3 times 10 to the negative uh, 10 to the negative 2 I think I did that conversion right. Um, instead, you just write that as 0 0.003, and that would be your floating point number. So let's see what this looks like. A floating point number also takes a bit more memory. It takes four bytes directly all the time. So, um, and that's because it has a very specific precision range there. So you know how much memory you're gonna need to store that value. I think with integers specifically, it ranges depending on how big the integer actually is. Now let's go into a data type called double precision. These are typically used when you're doing like very, very specific mathematical 
prompts, right? So for example, if you're doing some very clear scientific calculations and you need to be very precise with those calculations, it might be useful to shift from a floating point over to a double so that you have a bit more decimal places to play around with and then decide what's actually significant and all of that stuff. So this obviously means that you're going to take twice as much data or uh, as much room as a floating point. So in this case, we're taking eight bytes. So let's write this out. I just write out the same number. I mean, it really doesn't matter. It just means that there are more trailing zeros that can then do more precise, let's say divisions or additions and whatever you want to do there. So that's really the purpose behind that. From there, you have a Boolean value, which can either have a value of true or false. So this only stores data in one byte. I would say that technically you could store this in one bit, but I presume that C++ just doesn't have the capacity to store that data in one bit, which is why I assume the other data bits that exist there are used for something behind the scenes, or maybe they're not used for anything at all. I'm not too sure. It really just depends on the compiler and whatever else, you know, the C++ language was written w with, like the way that it's written, that's really what's going to dictate how that remaining data storage is actually being used. That's a bit out of the scope of what you need to know here, but what you need to know is this. You can write a Boolean as binary equals true. And all the rules that we talked about earlier about declaration and assignment and all that applies to every single one of these. So I'm saying Boolean binary is equal to true. You can also set it to false like I list here. But yeah, that's all there really is here. We'll get into more of the uses later on in a, in a future episode. Next, we have alphanumeric characters. So let's just write this out here. So char character equals a. You can also say it's equivalent to one. That'll also work. There are several other, several other characters here. You can do lowercase, you can do uppercase, whatever you wanna do here is just gonna work. It's just one character. And then finally, we have a cluster of characters which in C++ is called a string. This is what you're gonna use if you have a sentence, a paragraph, a word, anything more than a single character being put together, and that's why it's called a string. It's a string of characters. So the way that we're going to write this out is string str equals, and for this purpose, we'll just throw back to episode one and write hello world. That's really all there is to it. We have created several different variables here, all of different types. They can all be used in different ways, different applications. I mean, there are definitely times when you can use an integer, but you could also just use a floating point instead. Vice versa, I would say like for floating point and doubles, in, in a situation where you'd want to use those, it would be because an integer just isn't precise enough, doesn't have enough information there. So that's when that would occur. Similarly for characters, I mean, it really depends on the situation. I typically just use strings. Um, and then for binary, I feel like that's useful a lot when we get into loops and if statements and conditions and all of that stuff. So that'll be very important very soon, but just be aware that these different types are used for different things. And as of now, we know how to input output and create different data types. And yeah, that is all there is for this video. I hope you guys found it useful. Let me know your thoughts in the comments below. If you have any questions, let me know as well. If you liked the video, please like the video and subscribe for more videos for me on this channel. Thank you so much for watching and I'll see you next time. Have a wonderful day. Bye.